Thank you for that introduction. That's a, also a tough talk to follow. That's an excellent review of uh, TAP and the Quadratus Laborum block. And it just uh, gets me excited. I'm very excited about regional anesthesia and talking on the topic. And this is a nice segue from the TAP into talking about my topic today, regional anesthesia for breast surgery. Um, first, the disclosure slide. So uh, I have no disclosures about any companies or funding that I have, I, I do want to disclose that this is my first time to this part of the world, so I'm very excited to meet a lot of you and to learn from you as well at the conference. The part of the world that I'm from is in New England, and Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center is right here on this New Hampshire-Vermont border. I'm told that the New England's about the size of Scandinavia, and we cover um, some trauma from five states, Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, New York, and Massachusetts. Also, a little bit of a plug, it's an excellent time of year to go to New England if you've never been, as we get into the fall foliage season. So where do I work? Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center. It's a 400-bed level one trauma center. We also train 400 residents and fellows a year. So a very involved training center. In anesthesiology, we train seven residents. Each year, they do a one-year internship and then three years of dedicated anesthesia time. And we also have two regional fellows that spend six months in the operating room and six months exclusively with us in the regional block area. Uh, we also have a children's hospital at Dartmouth, that's what Chad is, and the Norris Cotton Cancer Center. And we have a very active orthopedic group where I do a lot of my studies on how we teach um, and evaluate residents with procedural skills. But like everybody else, regional is getting more and more into the world of abdominal surgery, and that's what we're going to hear about today, breast surgery. So what are we going to talk about? A little brief about cancer statistics, and unfortunately, how it's becoming more and more common. Then to understand where we're going to block these nerves and hopefully have an impact, we're going to go through breast innervation, and in particular an article that just came out a couple weeks ago from Glenn Woodworth and his group at OHSU, talking about breast innervation and an overview on blocks for it. We're going to talk about chronic pain after breast surgery, as it's all too prevalent. And then what are our options? Just like we just heard in the last talk, there's multiple options about where to inject, whether it's close to the neuraxis or as far out as you can get. We're going to go through that. And then we're going to talk about my decade-long experience at Dartmouth with this and how it has evolved into what we're doing today. Um, I'm not going to say that our way is the only way. What I've learned in anesthesia is there's many ways to get the same outcome. And we're going to hear the theme, do what you already do well if it works and it's appropriate. But we're going to go through when I think it's appropriate and when it works. So over 14 million cases of cancer each year. Over one and a half million of these are new breast cancer diagnosis. And unfortunately, over half a million deaths of breast cancer each year. The highly prevalent areas for breast cancer is North America, Northern and Western Europe, and Australia and New Zealand. In fact, one in eight women in the United States will develop breast cancer during their lifetime. So what's being done after the diagnosis? The surgery. So more and more we are diagnosing breast cancer in the early stages, stage one and two. This is the slide here that's on the left. And then it starts to march through what is the treatment for those. The first three bars are breast conservation surgery, so less, less invasive surgery, and then you start to get into mastectomies and radiation. The people not having surgery are these last two bars. So you can see with the early stage diagnosis, it's only 5%. So 95% of people are presenting to our operating rooms for a surgical procedure for an early diagnosed cancer. Stage three and four, it shifts a little bit from this breast conservation surgery more into mastectomies and mastectomies with radiation and it starts to get into um, the radical mastectomies which are less and less common. And then the no surgery group goes up to about 28% here. So what are we talking about when we're talking about breast cancer surgeries? Lumpectomies um, are, are taking a wedge of tissue out. And it's important to understand the surgery to understand how we're gonna cover this. Partial mastectomies are going and taking a larger base tissue. So why do pa patients have partial mastectomies? They might have more than one foci of the cancer. Their cancer may be too large for a simple lumpectomy, or they may have contraindications to radiation after. So the surgeon needs to take a bigger piece of tissue. The non-breast conservation surgery, simple mastectomy. It's important to know with that, most surgeons take the fascial layer over the pec major muscle. And we'll get back to why this is important a little bit later. And the radical mastectomy is taking not only all the breast and the tissue, but the two pectoral muscles beneath it and a complete axillary node dissection. And then as the cancer treatment evolves, 
more often people are getting breast conservation therapy, but we still have to cover the axilla because they're going there to do sentinel node biopsies. It's also important to know in, in, in our research if, if the plastic surgeons are going to be involved because you have to know if they're going to be putting tissue expanders in into the muscles or they're going to be putting permanent replacements in. When they put permanent replacements in, they actually sometimes stretch the serratus muscle to cover it, so you have to innervate that as well. And the implants are usually going beneath pec major and above pec minor. Also important, are they going to cover it with a flap? Many different flaps, whether it be trans flaps, DIEP flaps, or latissimus dorsi flaps, often these places can be more painful than the breast um, tissue as well. So you have to, will your technique cover these? Is it possible to cover this site as well as the breast with a, with a, a volume of local anesthetic? So getting into post mastectomy pain syndrome. This is kind of a little bit of a misnomer in its title because this can occur after mastectomy or breast conservation surgery. So when we're talking about post-mastectomy pain, it can be after a lumpectomy or a partial mastectomy. There's many definitions. One of the studies I'm going to talk about today defines it like this, having pain more than four days a week and severity is at least three on a zero to ten pain scale. So how often is this happening? Is it happening less that, that, that we're doing less invasive breast surgery? I'm going to argue today that it's not. The studies are showing that in a quarter to over a half of the patients that are coming for this surgery have post mastectomy pain syndrome that significantly affects their lives. So I'm going to argue today that hopefully we can make an impact on this rate with what we do in the operating room. So this is a, a study out of Denmark, actually, that looked at patients in 2003, 2004. Um, it was a, a retrospective looking back at, at over 200 patients that had breast surgery and 700 patients that didn't. So this is one of the only studies in the literature that looked at the whole group and said, are you having post mastectomy pain syndrome even if you didn't have surgery? So interesting enough, around 10% of people were reporting symptoms in their breast or the arm but 25% of people that had breast surgery were, which makes the odds ratio about 2.8 for developing post mastectomy pain syndrome after. I'd like to take a little sampling of research from over the world. So this is, we talked about Denmark, this was a study out of Turkey. It came out in 2016, and it was more looking at patients from 2012 to 2013, and I thought maybe over the years as we've gone to more breast conservation surgery, this is happening less. In fact, the prevalence was 24%. The risk factors for it, as we go back to this slide here, you can see prior breast surgery, younger age, and interestingly, upper lateral quadrant breast surgery. And as we go through the innervation, I think this is because you're starting to get into these nerves that are going to the axilla, the intercostal brachial and thoracodorsal, the long thoracic, and these nerves that can be um, implicated in the post mastectomy pain syndrome. The study out of Turkey, again, we saw a tumor in the upper lateral quadrant, and here a secondary treatment with radiotherapy. Study in 2013 out of Korea, again, younger age, more extensive surgery, axillary lymph node dissection, and interesting enough, 24-hour post-op morphine consumption, as well as acute pain. So higher pain scores after their surgery predicted chronic pain in these patients. So I'm going to argue that this is the area where hopefully we can have an impact in what we do. If we can reduce that acute pain and the pain wind up, can we reduce the chronic pain that these patients are having? So again, to understand where we block, it's, un it's important to understand the anatomy and what we're blocking. So the spinal nerves exit the intervertebral space and go through in into the paravertebral space, which we heard about before, into the dorsal and the ventral rami. The dorsal rami go and innervate the muscles of the skin over the back. The ventral rami actually go on to become the intercostal nerves, which very similar to the tap plane, run between the second and third layer of muscle. So you have the external intercostal, the internal intercostal, and the innermost intercostal. These nerves are running in between that second and third layer, just like the tap plane, along with the artery and vein. The intercostal nerves then go on to continue and then start to pierce these muscles next to the sternum and become the anterior cutaneous branches. We're going to go over how much of the breast they actually cover. You can see this pictorial shows them covering the whole medial half to the nipple. Now interesting, here you can see this part enlarged on the side. The intercostal nerves give up a lateral cutaneous branch at the mid-axillary line. This goes and pierces the three muscle layers and starts to run right under the costal margin and rib 
Um, and then this branches into two more branches, a posterior and an anterior division. For this talk, I'm going to refer to this as lateral cutaneous branches, so we don't get confused about the anterior division and the anterior cutaneous branch here. And then you can go see that it shows that that uh, goes to the nipple to the lateral side. I'm going to argue these lateral cutaneous branches are a lot more important than the anterior branches in breast innervation. So what levels are we talking about? We're talking about blocking the anterior branches from MRI studies, T2 to T5 with a variable input from T1 to T6. The lateral cutaneous, again, T2 to T5 with a variable input from T1, T6, and T7. The nipple is innervated by T3 to T4 with a variable input from T2 to T5. So as we're starting to talk about epidurals and paravertebrals, we've got to know what spaces we need to cover. So that is the breast tissue in the skin. But when we start talking about plastic surgery or simple mastectomies when we're taking the tissue, we need to start talking about the innervation to the muscles. So unlike the intercostal nerves, these are coming from our brachial plexus, and we have the lateral pectoral nerve. You can see the, the slide on the left with the cadaver slide on the right. So the lateral pectoral nerve comes from about C5 to C7, and it innervates the, the fascia above pec major, lying right below the breast tissue, and about half of the pec major muscle. The medial pectoral nerve goes on to innervate the rest of that pec major muscle and the pec minor muscle below it. This is more in the, the C7 to T1 range. Then we have the serratus anterior muscle and its innervation um, by the long thoracic nerve. So when we start to um, talk about implants where you're stretching the serratus, how can we cover this nerve as well? And then um, we also have the thoracodorsal nerve, which when you start to talk about latissimus dorsi flaps, it becomes important. So this is a very busy slide. It breaks every rule of a presentation of putting too much up on a slide at one time, but we're going to come back to this a lot. So this is from the Woodworth article in the group at OHSU, and it's an amazing slide once you start to break it down. So here at the top, it's talking about the innervation, so the cutaneous and the sub -Q. Here are the lateral branches that we're talking about, the axilla and the intercostal. Some people think the superior part of the breast has a little bit of supraclavicular nerve coverage, and that's varied in studies about how they've done the dissections. And then once you get into the muscles, the pectoral nerves, and the branches coming off, usually the cords of the brachial plexus that you see here. So now that we've covered the nerves, what are our options for covering them? And we're going to go through uh, each of these blocks in a little bit more detail. So local infiltration, most of the studies uh, come from the 1980s, and this was talking about infiltration for thoracotomies. It also extended to breast surgery. This one study from the Royal College of Surgeons showed that 14 out of 19 patients had their pain completely relieved after a lumpectomy or a wedge resection by putting 10 mLs of local afterwards. So we could say, why aren't we done? Here, this is, this is the only nerve block, you can see local, this covers everything. So the top part of the slide is the innervation. The second is the surgeries. So lumpectomies, partial mastectomies here, modified radical getting over here, and then some of the plastic surgery stuff extending here as well. Local covers everything here. Some downsides to local. It only lasts a few hours. So if you're trying to reduce morphine equivalent and pain wind up, you're not going to get a wonderful effect. And then local anesthetic to toxicity. As you start to extend into complete mastectomies and into the axilla, the amount of local that they're going to have to be using. And third, our surgical colleagues vary in their skill in using local anesthetic. We've seen it in our practice that it varies widely how well they anesthetize the patient with using local. So let's go from the periphery all the way back to the central neuraxis and start working back to the periphery again. So epidurals. We've talked about the innervation. Most of them are done at a single injection at T4, whether you place a catheter or not. Um, there's five randomized control studies in the Woodworth Review of Breast Surgery for Epidurals, and they work. What they're telling us is these patients had lower pain scores, lower nausea, they were leaving PACU quicker, and they were getting discharged from the hospital fairly quickly as well. Epidurals, as we all know, have the downside, like we talked about in the prior lecture, whether it be a sympathectomy. At our hospital, if you inject opioid, depending on what it is, it might be, include a 6 to 24 hour hospital stay. Most of these patients are leaving 45 minutes after surgery, so that's not really, it doesn't really work in our practice anymore today. 
Also, a quick aside about epidurals. This was the, uh, from Trans Group. It was a daring discourse that appeared in regional anesthesia and pain medicine. And it was about the primary failure of thoracic epidurals. So who in this room still does thoracic epidurals? Can you have a show of hands? Is anybody still doing it? Excellent. Is anybody's failure rate over 5%? That means over 5% of the time you're putting it in the wrong space. One. That's more than I see at my hospital, because when I, when I talk to my colleagues, nobody's uh, individual failure rate is more than 5%. Interestingly, when you actually look at the studies, the failure rate is 23%. So almost one in four people are putting them in the wrong place. And a primary failure means it's in the wrong place. Secondary failure is that it migrated or that you're not titrating it up. But we think we, this is, we've owned this for years, the epidural in, in anesthesia, and one in four, we're, we're not putting it in the correct space, is, is a little embarrassing. So how we approach this at Dartmouth, and we still do ep epidurals, um, all our non-obstetric ep epidurals are placed with fluoroscopy guidance, with the epidural gram as well. The, the slide on the left is an AP. One of the other consequences that comes out of this is we call them thoracic, but we usually enter in a low space. You can enter even lower, where the space is easier to get into, and then under visualization, direct thread that catheter up. This is the dye you can see being ejected on each side. And then in the lateral, you can see it running nicely in the epidural space. Now, every time you do something a little bit different, we were pretty proud of this. Our, we went up to a 97% well, primary success rate with this. There's also some downside. So most of our trainees are going out to hospitals that they don't have this service or available to them. So what we have is our trainees still place uh, epidurals in landmark technique. We lie them down, we do an epidural gram. It is amazing how many times those are epidural. They're not really epidural. Not, and you can see why people have a varying experience with pain relief after. So I'm gonna quickly go through the next part because we, we just kind of heard about this space in the last lecture of where it's extending. So after epidurals, people said, I can do a pair of a vertebral, little less side effect profile. This became popular again in the late 1970s with a reprisal of it as they started um, to talk about the benefits of the paravertebral space. Here again is that triangle that we looked at earlier and with the fascial layer that was talked about running along here, the border being here and the pleura being beneath. So the classic approach was to feel the spinous process and mark two and a half to four centimeters to the side to locate the transverse process and then walk off that to inject. You can see here how they mark the back. Now, just like everything, you have to weigh the risks and the benefits, so there's complications with this as well. This is an old study from the mid-90s where they had a block failure rate of 10%. So not the 23 we're seeing epidurals, but still too high. They were puncturing the pleural place about 1% of the time and some of those were resulting in clinically significant pneumothorax. So in 2000, when the, the boom of ultrasound started, it was first used in the paravertebral block just to identify the distance from the transverse process to the pleura, which gave the, the person performing it a little bit of a safety margin of how far to go. You can still see it's a very tight space, and depending on the angle of the ultrasound and how you measured it, you could still get into the pleura, or you could be above the superior converse tran transverse ligament here and not have an overly affected block. So after using it to mark, they started to use live ultrasound. Whether we do it in the transverse or sagittal plane is, is another talk, and whether to thread a catheter or not is a little bit too long for this today. But um, the downside of some of these blocks is, again, you could be pointing to the neuraxis. You can have epidural spread. Um, it's a very vascular area. They do work, however. This is a dye study, again, showing that they usually spread maybe a level above and below. In the Woodworth Review, there was 31 studies they looked at for paravertebrals. And again, they do work for breast surgery. So I'm gonna talk a lot about PECs today. If you're doing paravertebrals for breast surgery that's not involving the muscles, and you do a lot of them, and it's working well for you, you're probably doing an, an excellent job. Once you start getting into PEC major and PEC minor, you can see that these are, are not gonna cover them. Like I just said, they, they also have similar complications uh, to the epidural. But what I'm talking about here is the epidural and the paravertebral block do a great job of blocking that, those intercostals. The anterior lateral branches, you don't have to worry about them here because you're getting them both in the, dorsal, in the ventral rami as they come out. What you're not getting, though, here is these pectoral nerves. So Blanco, like we heard about before, came out and started to describe the pec block. 
and this was relatively recent in 2011, and he came out and said, you know, is there an easier way we can do analgesia, start to cover with a block for breast cancer surgery than epidural and paravertebrals? His first rendition came out and started talking about the infraclavicular space, and here's the artery and nerve. So those of you doing inter, inter, infraclavicular blocks are very similar. And what he was doing was injecting between the pec major and pec minor. And he did this in about 50 patients at first. And what the comment that he made in the paper is that it worked especially well for patients getting tissue expanders and immediate prosthesis placement that were subpectoral. Why that was working well, we now understand from the innervation. What runs here in this layer is the lateral and medial pectoral nerve. And if we go back here, this is what he was covering. So you're getting in here and you're starting to cover those muscles where that surgery was involved. So that's great, but you can see with the PEX1 block, which is right here on the slide, you then are missing what the epidural and paravertebral were covering. You're missing those intercostal nerves. So the PEX1, one injection alone, is not going to get you everywhere. So then the second rendition talked about a PEX2 block. And you have to be careful when you read the literature. Some people talk about PEX2 block as one injection here. So this is a PEC major muscle, this is PEC minor, this is serratus, pleurar, we're going to get into this a little bit more, and these are the ribs. And the PEC2 block is injecting one injection here between PEC minor and serratus, and now you're starting to get these lateral cutaneous branches. And then withdrawing or doing this on the in injecting again between PEC major and PEC minor. This has been studied. It works compared to nothing. It works compared to paravertebral. So there's one randomized control trial comparing the PEX2 block to one single injection T4 paravertebral block. And what that study showed is that the PEC block works better earlier and paravertebral lasts longer. So people that had the PEX block done had a longer time with their first analgesic request, better pain scores in the first 6 and 12 hours, and less morphine consumption in the first 24 hours. But once you got out to 16 hours and 24 hours, the pain scores were worse than the paravertebral. So again, now we're looking at the PEX 2, and you can see we're covering a lot. So you're covering the nerves here that are going to the muscle, you're covering the lateral cutaneous branches of the breast, Still not like local that covers everything. We're missing these anterior cutaneous branches that we talked about at first. Now I'm going to say it's debatable how important those branches are, but Blanco wasn't done there. He said, now, what, can I go out lateral and inject even further and do something called the serratus block? So when he talked about the serratus block, he was talking about going out to the mid-axillary line, injecting between the latissimus dorsi and the serratus anterior, and looking to see how much spread he could get. Now, he injected above the serratus, and he injected below the serratus, and looked at which came out better. This is a pictorial graph of, of one of our young colleagues and residents who volunteered. You can see we come out to the fifth rib in the mid-axillary line to do this block. He has excellent anatomy to see it, so you can see this is the, the teres major muscle. This is the serratus between the ribs and the latissimus dorsi. This would be the target for injection here. Now, the coverage, so the top slides here, this is injecting above and this is injecting below the serratus. When he looked at how dense of a block, injecting above patients did better, so that's where I suggest doing it that way. I also wanted to use this slide to show you're getting the lateral cutaneous branches here, some spread, and it's going way over the midline in coverage. So you're almost covering the whole breast there, you're missing this. What you're also missing with this slide, with the serratus, is those pectoral nerves. That's why this wasn't the, the final and end outcome. So here's just a quick review of, of Blanco's work with the, the PEX1 and the PEX2. This is actually a PEX2B. So PEX1 was one injection between major and minor. PEX2 is between major and minor, and actually minor and serratus. This is sh showing the below of the serratus. And then coming out even further lateral for the serratus block, injecting between those three muscle layers that I just showed you. So we've talked about how to cover the muscles, we've talked about how to cover the lateral breast, and, and maybe even more than that. What we haven't talked about is how to cover the medial breasts. And like us in regional anesthesia, we want to find the block for everything. So the, now the PIFP block is one of the newer things that's come out. This is the pecto-intercostal fascial block, or peristernal block, or PEC3 block, or all different kinds of words that you're hearing. So they're placing the, the probe run, running along the sternum. They're finding the uh, pec major muscle and the intercostal muscle in the intersection between four and five. They're injecting there to get these anterior cutaneous branches, these end branches of the intercostal nerve as it runs out. 
Now, that group wasn't the only group looking at this. This group looked at the transverse thoracic mus uh, muscle plane. So here there's the intercostal muscle and the transverse thoracic muscle are right in here. Now these new blocks, one, it hasn't been studied how much they're covering, and two, you're injecting pretty close to pleura here. So these are not uh, no risk, easy, let's just put some more local in type of blocks. So again though, the anterior tube, this is where they fit, so you're covering here. So options are local, perivertebral, depending on what it is, or get through. You can do a PEX-1, but you're not gonna cover a lot. PEX-1 works well for cardiac defibrillator placements and things like that, the muscle, right, lateral. PEX-2, starting to cover a lot. Serratus, we saw the, the innervation of the serratus, where I found that useful in my practice, is the thoracic patient that gets a chest tube and maybe never had surgery and shows up on our pain service. We can inject, we don't have to go to the paravertebrals, you don't have to do repeat intercostals, you can do a serratus and get a little bit more bang for your buck in time. And to be honest, I've done one anterior cutaneous branch block, so we're not doing a lot of these at our institution right now. And that's a nice segue into our experience with this. So prior to 2011, our surgeons were variably injecting local for this. In 2011, a part of our, our junior uh, fellows at that time said, we're looking at the literature, there's a lot of early literature about breast cancer and recurrence, and a suggestion that if you use a regional block, it might improve. And we said, wow, if, if this is true, we're gonna have to train a lot more regional anesthesiologists, and everybody's gonna be giving a block. So we need to learn how to do this. We talked with our breast surgery colleagues, they were all on board, and we said, let's start doing paravertebral blocks. They worked, patients were comfortable, but I'm gonna give you a little pictorial representation of our experience at Dartmouth. And to set up, it is how we have a five-bay preoperative block area where the patients come in, they get checked in, they get brought to us. We have dedicated sedation nurses to work with to do these blocks ahead of time. And block patients come in about an hour and 15 minutes prior to their surgery. That usually gives us plenty of time to consent, have a discussion with them about the block, risks and benefits, and then perform the block with plenty of time to set up prior to the operating room. Now these patients are getting younger and younger, unfortunately, with breast cancer. It's a very emotional time, and then they're coming in, and immediately they're being whisked away to radiology to maybe have a needle localization or other radiologic intervention to help the surgeon out. Then we had an issue with surgical consent, so more and more of them were getting plastic reconstruction. Our general surgeons were excellent about getting consent ahead of time. Our plastic surgeons like to do it about 20 seconds before you want to go to the operating room. So really, really hard to get it ahead of time and keep an operating room running efficiently. We started to run into time pressures, and overall the management was saying, you guys are slowing down the operating room. We tried to say we were helping the patients, but sometimes that doesn't work. Um, how to position for paravertebrals, it was more like an epidural. We often needed a nurse to hold or a sedation nurse if we had them sitting up. Often they couldn't lie prone because they had needles or they were uncomfortable. We had to give them a lot of sedation, so a lot more. Sometimes we use a benzodiazepine and an opioid, and we're sometimes giving more opioid to do the paravertebral block than they would have got if they just had their breast cancer surgery. So we're going ahead and completely defeating the purpose of doing that. Uh, trainees, so to teach, if you haven't done blocks before, don't go back and do paravertebral blocks as your first one. They're, they're not easy. So we have this group of fellows that come through for six months, and they can get really facile at doing these. But our residents only rotate through a month at a time. So when there's a paravertebral block, you had eight people in the room, somebody really struggled with it, the patient was almost under general anesthesia anyway. And as we all know, you have to live with your consequences, which is what we're experiencing right now. And this really created a headache for us all as we went through this. So we went back to our breast cancer surgeons and in 2014, we said, this new study has come out on, on PEC blocks. We think this might be a better way to do it and it might be better for the patients. Like anything else, we don't believe it unless we do it ourselves. We're lucky enough at the Geisel School of Medicine to have a cadaver dedicated to regional anesthesia. So we went there and to do a dissection. So this is the PEX-1 dissection with PEC major folded over and PEC minor. And you're seeing the lateral and medial cutaneous uh, branches, uh, lateral medial pectoral nerves there. So those nerves that are innervating the PEC muscles. Here then you, you flip the PEC minor over and they have serratus here. And all these nerves running here, those are the thoracic intercostal nerves, the lateral, lateral cutaneous. So we said this makes sense. Uh, anatomically, we should start doing this. So we still had consent and timing issues, but didn't, didn't answer that. We did have an improved side effect profile. 
Positioning the patients was easier. We're doing this with the patient supine. We're getting good pain coverage again, so said it's not, a, not an issue that is not working for the patients. But we still had to use a lot of sedation. So we're still chasing these patients coming through, which was kind of surprising, because when we do infraclavicular blocks, we weren't having to use a lot. So maybe it's just the, culture, the North American culture of pain and perception, but we still have to give uh, benzodiazepine and opioid we follow up with our block patients at Dartmouth with a phone call, and we were starting to hear more common that they wouldn't go through it again if they had another surgery, which was, which was new to us in our experience. So we went back to our breast cancer surgeon, and we said, what can we do about this? So this is a great time to highlight collaborating with the people on the other side of the tree. So if they don't buy into what you're doing, if your results aren't working, it's going to be harder and harder to continue the best practice for the patients. We're lucky enough, Dr. Carrie Rosenkrantz is an excellent breast surgeon, and she said, actually, I think you'll be saving time if you do these blocks of sleep in the operating room, because we're not gonna have to worry about the sedation out there. It's gonna be an easier block for you. Why don't you take five to 10 minutes at the beginning of my block and do this? And almost as importantly, she was an IDB goalie, and she still plays goal on our uh, men's league ice hockey team, which is a great uh, dual characteristic for somebody in New England. So from 2015 to today, we've been doing PEC blocks of sleep in the OR. They've been working. How we do them is after the patient's under general anesthesia, we put the probe on the contralateral side. We get the infraclavicular view. Next, we angle the probe out towards the axilla. And then we start to slide down away from the clavicle, about the third to fourth rib. And then personally, I like to tilt anterior. It helps to bring out the pleura and your, your real danger of doing this block and getting an interpleural injection. The next thing you're going to see is an actual video. Uh, and Condad, Cephalat here on the left, going Condad to the right. So it comes through, it'll restart again. These are the ribs, here are your muscle layers. So we're starting really high at the clavicle, right there. And then the first rib, second rib, and so on as we go down. Here's a, a picture, this is our target area. You have rib and rib here. A great defined plane, pec major and pec minor. What I wanted is this shimmering down here. This is the, the layers of the pleura on top of each other. So you can see, if your needle is not visualized, you still can have a pleural puncture with this technique. The labels, this is just a still image again. The red line is where you inject it for the pec one. The blue line is for pec two and pec one. What do we do? We position this and do one needle pass in plane. Um, superiorly along the clavicle of the third or fourth rib, and we go and do the deep injection first with 15 to 20 mLs, um, depending, our dose depends if it's half, uh, on one side or bilateral, but we're making sure we stay under 2.5 milligrams per kilogram or a total of 150 milligrams per, per block. And then we start to withdraw after we do the deep and put 10 to 15 mLs here between the pec major and the pec minor to cover those pectoral nerves. So this is live, and you can just see the needle coming in from the top left in an in-plane fashion. This is an example of the block. You see the unzippering, just like with the tap block on the, fascial, the classic tap block, they taught you to inject the fascial plane, you get the spread along here. And then this is in between the pec major and the pec minor, a great example of how far that block can spread. That's only a few cc's of local. Going right there. So our experience of switching, we have happy surgeons. Uh, sedation nurses are happier because they're not sedating people to a general anesthetic. Our residents who actually do do some work, but they're happier too because they're getting more exposure to these blocks. They're easier to teach than the paravertebral block in my experience. And our patients are happier and they're saying, I would definitely do that again if I had to come back for contralateral breast surgery. Now we're not just going by experience alone. We're collecting some data on this. This is just a, a, a table one version of our first 40 patients. Um, we deal with a lot of patients on Suboxone, a lot of high opioid patients, so we, we did have one come back for readmission, but most of these patients are getting uh, discharged uh, on the same day, or a significant amount, about 35% of them are. Um, we went on to present this as in, in the state's perioperative surgical home is a big catchphrase right now. So we went on to say we, we evaluated the patient's experience, we talked to them, we had some quality issues that weren't working. We worked with our surgeons to come up with a change. The change was to do this with sleep in the OR, and it's been improving our practice since then. So I'm going to save time for questions, so I'm not going to give this too much, but uh, we ruffled the feathers of some of our colleagues at, at the uh, 
American Society of Regional Anesthesia when we wrote a daring d discourse that maybe this should be time to liberalize our blocks under general anesthesia. I understand that's not as big an issue as so most of the European group and Ezra has looked at the data and come up with the same, uh, looked at the same data but come up with a different conclusion and, and more blocks are done under general anesthesia. We certainly didn't want to say that because we've done 40 fascial blocks you should do everything under general, but if you're sedating patients, you're giving them more opioid to do the block, then you probably want to want to reconsider how you're approaching things. Uh, so in summary, breast cancer is common. The rate of post mastectomy pain syndrome is too high. Hopefully with regional techniques we can start to decrease this rate. The innervation, the tissue of the breast is innervated by the intercostals, the underlying muscles innervated by the pectorals, and the axilla is innervated by the, the T2 or the intercostal brachial nerve. It's important to understand the surgical plan. So if you don't know what the surgeon's doing, you don't know how you can best help the patient. So you gotta know if plastics is gonna be involved, if they're gonna be using expanders, if it's the partial mastectomy where they're gonna be taking the tissue to understand what to do your block, and then you need to match the block with that surgical plan. So how do you cover it? You can see I'm partial to the pecs, so pecs is showing up everywhere, except for maybe those anterior cutaneous branches. Like I said, if you do a paravertebral for um, where they're just taking breast tissue and that works well for you, I'm not trying to change your mind. I'm just saying if, if you're doing uh, breast surgery with immediate reconstruction, the PEC so far for us has been a great alternative. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. I must say you fulfilled our expectations. Um, um, are there any questions from the audience? Thank you, my name is Slade, I'm going from France. Uh, thank you very much for your lectures. For the first time I hear something clear about that topic. That's, for me it's very important because most of the time we have something stupid concerning with no relation, there's no relation between the, the surgical aspect and the hours aspects. That's the number one. Number two, uh, I think, to my point of view, you forgot one important uh, technique, uh, local, tumescent local anesthesia. Lo local? Local, but tumescent. That Tumes means, yeah, tumescent, uh, I'll yeah. pronounce it. For me, it's very, very, probably the best technique and the most easy to learn and the safest, in my experience. <laughs> yeah, it, it's interesting. With, with our experience uh, with the tumescent, it was more for, for breast reduction surgeries. And actually, when we talked to the surgeons, because we had an incident of last, the surgeons had actually no idea how much local that they were putting in and, and couldn't even begin to understand how much was being absorbed by the patient. So uh, you're always kind of clouded by your, your worst recent outcome. So we actually don't do uh, blocks a lot. They're not using tumescent except for in breast reduction where we are we're actually able to collaborate with them and help them out and come up with some appropriate, appropriate doses. But again, if that works well for your population and it's safe, then, then I think there's, I'm not trying to change your mind from doing that. Thank you very much for your talk. Brilliant. Um, <clears throat> the only, uh, I would like to put a question to you about, what, what about the uh, thoracic sympathetic trunk? Because obviously you will get that with the peripatibo, but with the PECS, the modified PECS tool with serratus, you will not get that. I agree that it's a much simpler uh, block to perform, less of time, and it, and it gives you some satisfaction. But it's probably not as long lasting as the thoracic peripatibo, and you do not get the uh, thoracic sympathetic trunk. What, yeah. What's your comment on that? I, I think the, the sympathetic trunk is a lot more important in, in what you presented in abdominal surgery when, when you have a lot more visceral pain than we're seeing up here with breast surgery, so a lot more important there. And the, the one randomized control trial competing head-to-head -head with the pecs and thoracic did exactly what you said. The thoracic lasts longer because of where you're injecting it, but the PEC did a great job in the first 12 hours, and I think that's, that's really important. And then after that, with, a, with the addition of um, oral agents, we're seeing a patients not need a lot of opioid after the, the 12 to the 18 hours. The, 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 
So I, I've, I've heard that before as well in, in our group. We, we do certainly uh, have simple mastectomies where patients are reporting pain scores of seven or eight in the population. And I don't know if that, that's a wind up because they're coming to us on a lot of opioids or they're on antagonist, agonist, antagonist. Um, I certainly know that sometimes they do well with the general anesthesia, but they get a lot of opioid. And with all the in vitro uh, research of opioids and, and cancer recurrence, again, that wasn't a major part of this talk. I know if my family member wants to come in for surgery, I want, I want to do a TIVA, an IV an anesthetic, and as much regional as I can to avoid those narcotic agents and those inhaled agents. Thanks, Thanks for the excellent presentation. Um, I just had one question. Um, we do the PEX2 block for the uh, mastectomies with axillary dissections. Um, we are encountering one problem, that is the, the paranoia from the surgeons, um, that once uh, they do an axillary dissection, they feel that you are um, um, sort of getting in their um, you know, field of dissection. There's a lot of fluid there, and they're, they're, they're just generally worried that this, there's no, uh, uh, they ask for evidence, is this a safe block when there is, uh, you know, when they do a, a axillary dissection. So do you have anything to comment on that? Yeah, I think again, it, it stresses the point of collaborating with the people on the other side of the tree, understanding their fears and worries, and then explaining the data that works and, and the, the, the risk. I think if you start to talk about them, about impacting this post-mastectomy pain syndrome, that if they're following these patients out to see, it's a risk benefit. Our, our surgeon hasn't had any issues with uh, dissecting into the axilla after this pec, the PEX2 block. But it is important to make sure the whole team's on board. We, our plastic surgeons don't like us if they're doing a, a flap reconstruction to be in, injecting up in the breast for the same reason. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I have one additional question. Uh, from a safer point of view, uh, which block uh, do you think is the safest of these blocks? In, in, in training for us, uh, it, the PEX block it, it has been the safest in our experience. I, I know from talking to you uh, prior, you, some in, uh, incidents of last, but with us keeping the total uh, milligram dose below 150 and the volume it, it, to 2.5, we haven't had any issues with last. Now these are certainly low numbers as we know, uh, last is a very rare outcome nowadays uh, in, in the anesthesia, but the PEX block is still a lot safer than epidural and paravertebral in our hands. Thank you. Thank you for two very excellent speeches.